It's August 3rd, 2023. This is the best of Rook. Welcome to episode 276 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hi, hello to you. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durubasham. I hope you're doing well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. We are, of course, on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Today's episode is part of a Best of Rook series we are bringing to you for the entire month of August, where we're looking back at some of our favorite interviews over the last three and a half years since we launched Rook and some of our most entertaining moments, and we're giving them to you. We've curated our faves, and we hope you check out these conversations, especially if you may have missed them the first time. Today on the program, truly one of my most memorable conversations on this show in recent times, an interview with award-winning British poet and legendary translator of everything from Hafez to the Shahnameh to my uncle Napoleon, Dr. Dick Davis. His background in understanding Persian literature and poetry and his experiences inside Iran before the 1979 revolution are wondrous to hear about. You don't want to miss this. Plus, on this episode, we're going to give you one of our favorite funny moments from our Rook catalog. This one entitled Ugi and the Rasu. <laughs> the story of what happens when your little French bulldog has a run-in with a skunk. We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. If you like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in both Persian and in English, check us out on Telegram. Our website is rookmedia.com, and you can support us by going to rookmedia.com. And on that main page, press support us funny enough that's the way to support us it leads you to a page where you can become a rook member on patreon and enable and support what we do by becoming a subscriber to our rook membership on our patreon page rookmedia.com all right let's get started Well, if you want to learn about Persian literature and poetry, one of the most esteemed and best known names you might turn to is actually a non-Iranian. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and has been hailed as the finest translator of Persian poetry. That's right. Our feature guest on this edition of The Best of Rook, Dr. Dick Davis, is an award-winning British-born poet, university professor, translator, and leading scholar of Persian literature who has made it his lifelong mission to introduce Persian medieval poetry and lit to the Western world. Dr. Davis received his MA in English literature from Cambridge University back in the 1960s. A strong desire to travel took him to the East. He moved to Tehran in 1970 and started teaching English at the University of Tehran. He met his life companion there and has collaborated with her in some of his translations. In the chaos of the revolutionary period in Iran, Dr. Davis returned to the UK in 1978 and set about obtaining his PhD in medieval Persian from Manchester University. In the UK, he taught at Durham, Newcastle, and after subsequently moving to the United States, he has taught at UCSB and at Ohio State University, where he's been a professor of Persian and the chair of the Department of New Eastern Languages and Cultures. His books of translations include Borrowed Ware, Medieval Persian Epigrams, The Shahnameh, The Legend of Siavash, Rostam, Tales of Love and War from Persia's Book of Kings, Vis and Ramin, and Faces of Love, Hafez and the Poets of Shiraz. And Dr. Davis's own poems about Iran include At Home and Far From Home, poems on Iran and Persian culture. And of course, he is famously the translator of the very popular landmark novel by Iraj Pezeshkzad, My Uncle Napoleon. Dr. Dick Davis joined me from Columbus, Ohio, here is our conversation. Hello, sir. 
Hello. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. What a great pleasure and honor it is for me to speak to you. I, I can tell you that uh, much of what I've read of Persian poetry and literature, uh, I've read your words uh, as much as I've read the author's words. So uh, it's, it's an honor. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you. Th thank you for asking me. Um, by the way, you are in the Midwest, but I understand that you and your wife, Afkham, have found a fertile Persian community in, in Columbus, Ohio? Yes, there's quite a nice Persian community in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and uh, yeah, most of our, most of, almost all our friends are Iranians belonging to this local Iranian community. Um, and we've been here for over 30 years, so it's quite a, we, we, we have a small circle who we see pretty well all the time. Uh, and that most of them have been here for almost as, as long. So it's a well-established little community. You, you still um, don't sound like an American Midwesterner. I guess you can take the boy out of Portsmouth, but... Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're right. I, it depends. Um, you're right. Uh, when I, I, My mother has passed now, but when I used to go home to see her, she used to say to me, Richard, you have an American accent. And I said, well, nobody in America thinks I have an American <laughs> accent. <clears throat> I think it's a bit transatlantic now, mid-Atlantic now. It's sort of somewhere in between the two. It's very, it's a very elegant anyway. I, th let's put it that way. Let, Dr. Davis, well, I, nice. I want to ask you about the approach and the, the responsibilities of being a high-profile, world-renowned translator. But uh, let me first ask you about your life journey, because I, I think... It shall be quite fascinating for people of Iranian descent to hear about how you fell in love with Iran and and Persian culture. And let me start with a general question. Um, as I intimated in the in the intro there, or said it directly, I should say, uh, you've made it this mission to bring uh, Persian literature and poetry to the Western world. Why? Well, uh, I went to Iran in 1970. I was 25 in 1970, so I was a young man. And... Uh, through various events happening there and people I met and so forth, I really fell in love with the country and the culture. And I think I would have stayed indefinitely if the Islamic Revolution hadn't happened. Um, and, and the reason I left was not especially because of the revolution. It was because the universities were closed, and so I wasn't getting a salary. Um, so I, I didn't have anything to live off. Um, so uh, I and my wife, we married in 1974, um, I and, uh, and my wife, we returned, we went, we went to England. And um, I realized that I had begun to read Persian poetry then. I had a very good teacher in Iran. When I was an undergraduate, it was the medieval period I was most interested in. And uh, even for somebody who knows almost nothing about Persian literature, um, which I, I was in that position when I went there in 1970, the fact that Persia, Iran had a great medieval literature, I knew that much, although I couldn't read any of it or just mm. little bits in translation. And so because I was interested in Western medieval literature, I thought I would try and read Persian medieval literature. And as I say, I, I was lucky to find a very good teacher. And so I started to read it, and I really did fall in love with it. One of the things that I noticed was that in many ways it's very similar to, to European medieval literature. There are many similarities, which we can talk about later if you like. Uh, but there are also, of course, major differences. And so this this sense of f familiarity and unfamiliarity together I found really intriguing. And Persian poetry, one of the things I've always liked about poetry, um, and this might seem very obvious to an Iranian, but it's not necessarily obvious to a Westerner, is that I like the beauty of the poetry. And, and beauty is, is, of course, people in, in, in the West, in, in Europe, they, they like poetry to be beautiful, but it's not often the major thing. Um, it is in it is in a place like Italy, for example, but not in England. Mm. English poetry doesn't particularly try to be beautiful. It tries to tell the truth. It tries to be accurate. Um, it tries to sort of um, change things. It it tries to be psychological. All sorts of things. And beautiful among them, but beautiful isn't first. And one of the things that I really loved about Persian poetry was the the fact that it it valued beauty so much, that beauty was so important in it. And that was something that I hadn't really come across in English literature, mm. for example. I mean, it, it's interesting because taking a few steps back, and and if I can just pick up on a number of um, things along the way that you've just mentioned. First of all, you didn't come, as I understand it, you didn't come from a family of academics. You grew up in a, in a town called Withersnee in Yorkshire in England, and 
you credit a teacher or a headmaster at your school for getting you interested in poetry in the first place. Did you have any exposure at all to, to Persian literature or poetry when you were a, a kid in Britain? Well, um, not really. I mean, I read I read Fitzgerald's translation of Omar Khayyam, and that was about it. I mean, that's that's all that I knew. Of course, when I was young, and I'm in my 70s now, but when I was young, which is yeah, it's a long time ago, um, Omar Khayyam, Fitzgerald's Omar Khayyam was still a book that you would see in most households that had any books. It was, in, in a way, it's very strange. It's, a, it's Obviously, it's a translation, but in a way, it was the most popular book of poetry that existed when it when it was published. It was published in 1859, and it, by the end of the 19th century, it was it was the best-selling book of poetry in all of England of, of any kind of poet at all. And so that was in in our house hmm. because um, my my family were not especially educated, but th- there were lots of books in the house, and that was there. But that was the only example I had of, of medieval poetry. And I guess so the, you you had this. Somebody would say Iran, and you had this sort of exotic impression of this place, this eastern uh, mystical place? Yes, you're right, you're right. And of course, Fitzgerald's, I mean, I, Fitzgerald's translation is a, is a wonderful work in English. Uh, and it does it does convey quite a lot of what's in Khayyam, although it's, as many people have pointed out, it's not especially accurate. But Fitzgerald himself never went anywhere near Iran. He never went east of Paris. Mm. And so his notion of Iran was an entirely fanciful one. Mm. And so the Iran you get from his translations is, it's a kind of um, romantic European version of Iran. It's not, it's, not, it's not any kind of truth, in fact. But it's very charming. So, so by the time you're at Cambridge, you're studying English medieval poetry. Uh, That's right. How does the how does the boy from um, Portsmouth who grew up in Withersnee, who's at Cambridge, studying English uh, poetry, end up traveling to first Italy and then Iran by 1970? Well, um, various things happened when I was a, a young man that meant that when I graduated from Cambridge, when I went down. Uh, I wanted to leave England. I wanted to get away. I wanted to sort of see the world a bit. Also, this was the 1960s, and it was very common for people to sort of take off for a while, especially Europeans, to take off and sort of go on a hippie trail or something like that. I didn't actually do that, but I, I was part of that general sort of get out and see the world feeling that there was in the 1960s. And it was much easier to do then than it is now. And it was much safer to do it then than it it is now. Um, And also, I I mean, it was it was only 20 years since the Second World War was over and Europe was being um, rebuilt. And there was it was very easy to get a job. It wasn't as if you went to a, a new country and you didn't know whether you'd get a job or not. It was very easy to do so. So first I went to Greece and I, I had a very good time in Greece. But then there was the coup in Greece. So there was a, a fascist coup in, in 1967. So I left Greece. Then I went to Italy and I had a great time in Italy. And I really, uh, I, I, I almost, what Iran has become to me, it almost happened in Italy. But for one reason or another, it didn't. Uh, and then I had a friend who I had been an uh, undergraduate with. We'd been together as students. And he's still one of my closest friends. And he was on an archaeological dig in Iran. Um, this is in 1969, I think. And um, he wrote to me saying that he, he loved the country. It was so beautiful. He was having such a great time. And although he was there just for the summer to help on the dig, he wasn't an important archaeologist or anything. He was just somebody who'd gone to sort of um, do the amateur bit <clears throat> of digging things up and brushing things off and cataloging things and that kind of thing. But he'd had such a wonderful time. He said, I'm going to stay in Iran and get a job teaching English for a year. Why don't you come? And you'll enjoy it, I know, mm. because... Uh, we had been in Italy together and he knew how much I enjoyed Italy. So I did. So I went there. And I went there in theory for two years. I went with a two-year contract. But by the time I was getting towards the end of the two years, I had met Afram, who I finally married, uh, and I wanted to stay. So when the, that two-year contract was finished... So, I, so hang on I, a second. These are pivotal years you're rushing through here. The, the, that's right. The, yeah. the first, tell me about your first impressions when you get to to Tehran um, because I mean the romantic version of this story is that you arrive in Iran and go oh wow and it fills your heart because you know that for the rest of your life you're going to be dedicating your yourself to this place was it like that or how, how did you how did you feel when you first got there it wasn't quite like that and I, of course I first got there in I got there to Tehran 
which was, uh, you know, it was a modern city of the 1960s, especially if you were in the center of Tehran, which is where all the foreigners like me tended to be. Um, to see anything that was remotely like um, a European might imagine Iran to be, you had to certainly leave Tehran, and you, you probably had to leave the cities altogether. Uh, and of course, at the beginning, I didn't do that. So it wasn't that foreign at the beginning. What was all that was the main thing that was foreign was was the language. And of course, there are cultural differences that you pick up. But I had lived in different cultures. I, I expected cultural differences, and they didn't particularly faze me. Um, the thing that was crucial, the thing that sort of changed everything for me, was what sounded like something very negative, which is I got very ill. Hmm. I had been in, in Iran, I went in September, I think, in 1970. And by 1971, I think February, February 1971, I, I, I was very ill. And I finished up in hospital. And um, th th there was a nurse there who I fell in love with, who, who is now my wife. And it was because of her that I stayed. Wow. And it was because of her that I started to get really serious about Iranian culture. Because I really fell in love with her very strongly. It wasn't, it wasn't a... You know, it wasn't a, well, this will be interesting for a month kind of thing. It was, a, I want this for the rest of my life kind of thing. Oh, I didn't realize, I didn't know the nurse part. I didn't know that that's where you guys met. It's a bit the English patient, isn't it? <laughs> it is the English patient, actually, yes. <laughs> it's very similar. And, uh, of course, if I was, if I was going to... Um, I knew quite soon that I wanted to marry Afghan. Afghan was much more cautious about this than I was. I mean, she, it took, took her quite a long time to say, well, yes, that's possible perhaps in the future. Um, but I knew that if, I was if it was going to happen, I knew enough about Iranian culture to know that she just couldn't take off and marry me, that I had to get to know her family, her family had to accept me and all that. And I realized if I was going to do that, I had to really immerse myself in Persian culture, try and learn Persian, try and... Uh, adapt to the, to the kind of social customs of Iran um, in a way that I wouldn't have done if I hadn't have met Afghan. I, I, my stay in Iran would have been something like my stay in Italy. I'd have stayed for a couple of years and thought that was a wonderful culture. Now I go somewhere else. But because I met Afghan, I didn't go somewhere else. I, I stayed and uh, I started to learn Persian. And then my interest in, in medieval poetry it was vaguely in the back of my head, well, there's a great poetry over here from the medieval period. Why don't I try and access it as far as I can? And I found a teacher and I started to do that. And, and at that point, what with Afram, meeting Afram and the poetry together, by the, by the end of 1971, I was hooked. And that's <laughs> it. I thought, this is where I was. By, by the way, I understand her parents, uh, her parents didn't care for you at, at first. Uh, how did you manage, how did you stick handle that? Well, you're right. They, they didn't care for me at first, and I don't blame them, really. I mean, I have, I have daughters myself now, and I can see myself, you know, when my daughters were in their early 20s. I was 21 when I met her. I was 25. Um, if some 25-year-old turned up on my doorstep to take away my 21-year-old <laughs> daughter, and he was from a completely different country, and he spoke a language that I didn't understand, I can well understand why, why um, Afghan's family were not terribly keen on me. Um, and I certainly, in retrospect, don't blame them for it. In fact, um, Afghan's mother, uh, quite early on, I think, she decided I was all right. And mm -hmm. she, she worked on her husband. Who? Why on earth do you uh, think she decided that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really don't. She, actually, Afghan's mother was a tremendous... She's, she's passed now. But she was a tremendously warm, generous, kind woman. And I think she just, instead of seeing me as a foreigner, she just saw me as a young man who was interested in her daughter. Um, and she tried to sort of weigh me up, whether I was sort of worth it, as it were, whether I would treat her well, um, you know, if we, if we were together, whether it might last or not. I, I, th I think she sort of gave me the benefit of the doubt. Her husband, um, he had much more traditional views. Her husband was retired from the army. Um, and... Uh, like a lot of army people in Iran at that time, he had sort of, well, um, I, I, as you said, I translated my uncle Napoleon. He wasn't quite like Daijan, but he was along those lines in some ways. You know, he, um, he really didn't trust the British at all. Um, and of course, he lived through the Mossadegh crisis and all mm. that. And when the British um, did not come out of it at all well, behaved very badly, in fact. And so he had rather a negative view of the British. Um, and uh, it took some time to, to wear them down. It took took three years, in fact. 
But after three years, finally, he, he said, uh, OK, well, if you want to get married, all right. So we did. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get married in 1974 in Tehran. Um, That's right. You, what was it like being an English teacher at Tehran University? Actually, I, I didn't like it very much, to be honest. Um, the classes were very, were, were very sporadic and, and regimented. Uh, I didn't feel... I, I came with a group of people. Uh, there were about eight of us or ten of us, I think, all hired together. And they had hired eight or ten Americans at the same time to do exactly the same jobs. And then we, we found out when we had been there only a few months or even less than that, I think, that, we were, that the Americans and the English were being paid completely different salaries to do exactly the same work. And, I, and, and in fact, the English were coming out of it better. We were being <laughs> better paid than the Americans. Of course, the Americans were really furious about this. And so, uh, foolishly... Wow, um, the, the, the symbolism here, the, the imperialism, uh, the, the, the two, two big cultures having at it. Uh, in, in, exactly. <laughs> at their prey, yes. I mean, this is very interesting. Well, anyway, anyway the, the Brits decided they would support the Americans, foolishly enough. So we went off all together and we said, look, we all have to be paid the same. And they said, right, you can all be paid what the Americans are paid, which meant that we were going to get a drop in salary. And there were various other problems with, and so uh, when I stopped that job, and then I got a, uh, I got a position teaching English in a small college in the north of Tehran, um, uh, and that was very pleasant. It was much smaller. The staff were very nice. Uh, I, I, I had a good time there, and um, and also I was able to teach some English literature too, because there were some students who knew English very well. So I could teach some Shakespeare and some British poetry, and I liked doing that, as well as just teaching the language. And so when I got, by the time I got there, I, I had a good time. I enjoyed that. But my experience of actually Tehran University was not very positive, unfortunately. I mean, Dr. Davis, uh, by, the, by the time the, the late 70s are coming, and, and of course, um, 78, 79, the, the revolution is, um, um, we all know that students played a big role in that, at least in the forefront of demonstrations. And so you're mm -hmm. teaching students. You must have had some awareness of the agitation that was coming what what was what was life like for you in the lead up to november 78 when when you end up leaving um it was well it, it it didn't become very obvious until um say the beginning of 78 by that i mean to a foreigner by that time it was fairly obvious that that um there, there were strong social undercurrents and there was a possibility of major upheavals. Although almost to the very end, you know, almost everybody believed this will b blow over. That, that is, the Shah would not leave. Um, that, that, because there had been previous moments like this in, uh, in the Shah's reign in which they had in fact managed to neutralize the opposition. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and it was thought that this would happen again. But, of course, I was teaching young people. Most of the young people were involved in some way or other in, in, in political... Um, they all had political views, and, and a lot of them had, were, were active politically, too. I, I can't remember exactly when it was. I think it was probably about April or May in 1978, Somebody in one of my classes obviously passed on something I had said. I was very careful what I said in class. But even so, something I had said was passed on to the secret police. And I was summoned I, and uh, um, interrogated quite, quite, I mean, I, 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 was, uh, I was frightened. I wasn't actually hurt physically at all. Interrogated but, because uh, they thought you might be a revolutionary? some kind in because i somebody had said i was saying things that were derog derogatory about the government or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and they never actually told me what it was that i was supposed to have said so it was difficult to defend myself because i didn't know what i was defending myself from anyway mm -hmm. um they finally got me to sign a paper saying i would never do this again and that kind of thing and they just let me go but that was a, a, a bad a bad day but uh, it didn't have repercussions. But later on, when the, re when the demonstration started and there was the massacre in Medan and Jalais and all that, um, my wife and I were living on one of the main streets, which was then called Villa. I don't know what it's called now, um, which was a big, wide street. Um, and uh, it was wide enough for tanks. And uh, there were tanks in the street and there were soldiers and there was occasional firing. And we had some friends, uh, for the two, two people from India, who were good friends of ours. And they lived on a, in a back street um, 
uh, where tanks couldn't get down. It was very narrow. And they said, why don't you come and stay with us until all this blows over? Um, because everybody thought it would blow over. So we stayed with them. And finally, actually, we actually left Tehran from their, from their flat. We never went back to, to our own apartment. And how hard was it to leave in November of 78? Well, um, we finally left by bus because it was impossible to leave by plane. It was very, very difficult to leave by plane. I had a, I had a student, one of my students worked at the airport, and uh, he, he said that, you know, he would get us plane tickets and so forth. And I think he really meant to, but he was unable to. And we left by bus. And going by bus, it wasn't that difficult. But still, uh, I think it was for some Iranians, but it wasn't for us. How hard was the it main... emotionally to leave? Is, is kind of where oh, I was Oh, yeah, it was, it was very emotional. It was very, especially leaving uh, Afghan's family. Uh, Afghan's mother was terribly upset. And her father was upset, too, though, though he was much more kind of... Oh, he was an army man. You know, he, he didn't show it so much, but I could see he was. Um, uh, and uh, I think Afghan's mother wondered whether she'd ever see Afghan again. She, it, that was quite difficult, parting from them. Um, the main thing, the, the, the main kind of uh, crisis or, or, or uh, uh, moment when things seemed might, might, they might go wrong for us um, in, le- in leaving Iran was that after Afghan and I married, Afghan was still working. And I was working too, and we were living off my salary and saving Afghan's salary. Um, we had intended to buy a, a, an apartment in Tehran. Anyway, that's what we were doing, and we had quite a bit of money in the bank. Um, it was, you know, enough to buy a small apartment, something like that, which we had saved up. But then, just just about when we wanted to leave, there was a, um, a, a kind of order came down from the government that no money could be exported from Iran, that no money could be sent mm-hmm. out of Iran. And so I, we thought, well, we're going to lose it all. And I, I had a, a, a student, I said I had a student who worked at the airport. I had another student who worked at the National Bank, the Banque Meli. And he said to me, he was a very nice young man, and, and he said to me, I don't know if you trust me, but if you make a check out to me uh, and give me the money and give me your account in England, when you get to England, all your money will be there. And I said to Afghan, what do you think? She said, well, we're going to lose it anyway, so you might as well risk it. And I did exactly that. I gave him the check, and we got to England, and every single penny was there. God mm. bless him. Yeah, it was, it, I was very, very touched. And by that time, we had lost touch with him. I tried to get in oh, touch with wow. him to thank him, but things were so chaotic then. And well, he, you, he, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about you and this this move. I mean, you, from what I understand of your story, you can clarify if I, if, I, if I don't have this correct, but your serious academic study of Persian literature doesn't start until after you return to England in 78, um, in the midst of that coming revolution in Iran. Um, and, I, and I think about that, and I think, was that a... I mean, in a bizarre um, and in perhaps in a macabre kind of way, was that a was that a, a happy accident? Like without the revolution, you might have been forever an English teacher in Tehran, but instead you you become this um, this uh, academic and and writer and translator of Persian literature. I, well, in a way, yes. I, I guess for us, it was a happy accident. Um, what happened was that, you know, I had spent eight years in Iran by then, and I'd, I hadn't been. To, I think I'd been back to England once in that eight years, very briefly, and I had really, you know, I, I'd become soaked in Persian culture and my wife's family and all that kind of stuff. And of course, we got to England, and none of it was there. I missed it, um, and Afghan, of course, missed it profoundly, um, and. Uh, I thought, I don't want to lose all this. Well, I've started to read this medieval poetry. I'll throw myself into that. Which, And then another thing that had happened was that the very last class I had, um, the last year I was teaching, the students in that class, many of whom were very political, they were the students who used to tell me there's going to be a demonstration, don't go down this street on that day and that kind of thing. They were very nice, very friendly students. They gave me a... The complete edition of what was 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 then the standard edition of the of the Shahnameh, which was called the Moscow edition. They gave me the Moscow edition of the Shahnameh in nine volumes, hmm. uh, which, as a goodbye present, which was terribly sweet of them. Wow. It was very nice of them. Hmm. And I got back to England with the nine volumes of of, of the Shahnameh, and because I felt so nostalgic for them, um, because they were such, I thought, well, the least I can do is try and read it. So I started to read it, and of course, um, sorry, what you, language was it in? It was all in Persian. In Persian, okay, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, because the, you haven't translated it yet, 
<laughs> I hadn't translated it. Right, right. your, your book hasn't come out yet. Yeah. No. So I was reading it. I, I started to read it. And in fact, I said there were nine volumes. And I really got, I got hooked into it. Um, there are things about starting with Ferdowsi that are good. One, one thing is that Ferdowsi has a relatively small vocabulary compared with many authors. At the moment, I'm translating a, po- a poem by Nizami, who has the most enormous vocabulary. Mm. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I've been working with this language for 40 years, and I'm still looking at words because of Nizami's using very obscure words. But N- Ferdowsi doesn't do that. He has a few obscure words, but in general, it's a small vocabulary, so you can get used to it fairly quickly. Also, Ferdowsi's um, writing is very clear. He means what he says, and he says what he means. Um, and there's a kind of simple, strong nobility about it. I don't mean simple in a, in a bad way, but, but it's, it's strong and clear. And so it's not that hard to read as soon as you get used to the mm. slightly archaic language. Uh, but it took me almost a year to read the first volume of the nine volumes. But then the other eight volumes I read in the, in the, in the next year. So I, was, I had sort of got into it by, by the time I ended the first volume. And it was reading the Chalamet, I thought, I want to do this properly, academically. And I started to ask around to see if I could do a doctorate in, in, in medieval Persian. You know, I, and I, I was ex- uh, sorry. I was accepted at two places, Cambridge and Manchester. And uh, Cambridge said, "Well, you can come, but you're on your own." And Manchester, they said, "You can come, and we'll give you money for two years." So I went to Manchester. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, I was going to ask you about the Shah Nameh because this is um, Ferdowsi's epic Book of Kings. Uh, uh, you've written, you've done the translation of it. You've also written a, a book denoting its importance. I, um, I mean, in a nutshell, why is the Shah Nameh, you've talked about the writing style, but why, why is it so vital? Or is it so vital? Do you think that we should all be reading it? Oh, yes. It's, it's, um, it's, I, um, let, me, let me digress for a moment. If you translate a work, uh, you, obviously you get to know the work very well if you translate it. And I, I have found by translating works that by the end of doing it, by getting to the end of it, you either hate it and you really had enough of it, even if you started off rather admiring it, or your admiration for it has increased exponentially. Mm. And that's what happened with, for me with, with, with Ferdowsi. When you start to read Ferdowsi, it seems fairly simple. You think, uh, is there much to this, or is it just a superficial story? But then you realize, and it's an extraordinarily profound and very wise um, disquisition on the nature of human life, on the mm. nature of power, ambition, um, authority, heroism, cowardice, all those things. It's the most, it, it's the most marvelous kind of panorama of the possibilities of being human, how you can be good and how people are evil. And one of the great themes that goes through the Shahnameh, goes through right from the beginning, right to the end, is if you have a good man and he lives under an evil government, what should he do? Um, and of course, I had just left Iran in the revolution and that, that idea, what do you do when, when you hate the government? What do you do? Do you rise up against it? Do you try and tolerate it? Do you just leave? Do you wash your hands of it and just say, I don't care? What do you do? And the Shahnameh examines that, that, that problem over and over again. And it, and it never really provides a solution. That's another great thing about the One of, I, I've realized that somebody, I've lived my whole life in literature. And it's not just the literature of Iran, but the literature of other literatures that I, that I know too. The really great works, they don't answer questions, they ask questions. Mm. Um, the, the, and and, this, and this, the Shahnameh does that. You don't have easy answers at the end of the Shahnameh. You see that the, that the problems of government, um, the problems of human relationships, the problems of father-son and husband-wife right, and right. Uh, all those relationships, that they are complicated and difficult and that they are not simple answers, answers to them. Uh, and, and you get that in Shakespeare, too. Um, Ferdowsi is easily comparable to Shakespeare. I mean, he's, just, he's just certainly as great an author as Shakespeare, mm. um, uh, if not greater. Um, so my feeling for... I, how do you, the sorry, more I read how do, the how do, you, how do more, you come to that... Uh, uh, not why is fair to see as good as Shakespeare, but how do you even compare? Is it, are you talking about the strength of storytelling or, or characters or, I mean, how do you, when you think about what you just said, what, what do you actually mean that um, fair to see is as strong as Shakespeare? 
Well, I, I would say the same of Nez Almi, but it's for completely different reasons. With Ferdowsi, what you have, you have a sense of the of the depth and complexity of life, and you have a you have a, a strong sense of of um, humane generosity towards different ways of living. Mm. You get, and you get that in Shakespeare. That is. Um, the fact that the Shaname is so long is important. If you only read bits of it, you're only getting a bit of it. You're only getting a bit of what, what, it, what, what it says mm. because there is such variety in it. There's, there's such um, richness in it. Uh, and you get all these, these different versions of how to live and what it is to be human, which Ferdowsi is, is, is every, I mean, he doesn't make the stories up. He, re, he gets the stories from elsewhere, but he uses the stories to examine the things he's interested right, in. Right. And it's clear that what he's interested in questions of conscience, what should the good man do? It's very, very um, strong. People always say the Shalom is an epic, and of course it is an epic. But the great thing about most epics is that your side has to win. Um, <laughs> and of course, that, that, that's important in the Shahnameh too. The Iranians have to win. But the great heroes in the Shahnameh, they don't ask themselves, how do I win? They ask themselves, what must I do to be good? What is the ethically uh, uh, right thing to do? Uh, it, it, it's, what, it's Shakespearean also in the sense of, I mean, probably not just Shakespearean. Uh, this is probably a hallmark of great poetry. You tell me if it isn't. But but the the questions that are being asked are particularly time agnostic right it's not it's yeah. not it's not how do we win the war in 1940 it's it's big questions around humanity morality love that really are as relevant today as they would have been 2000 years ago absolutely i mean it's it's absolutely true i i um, pe people say it as a cliche you know if you want to understand iranian culture read the shanome but there's a lot of truth in it I mean, the, a lot of what, what is in the Shahnameh um, is still present in Iranian culture. Um, I mean, despite the fact that many of the mullahs would like it not to be there, but it is still present in Iranian culture. It, you, as you say, it's time agnostic. Hmm. It, it crosses time periods. You, you know, when, you, when we talk about, I mean, I should remind people who are, because I suspect a certain audience will just know you for your great translations and and not be as well uh, um, versed in the fact that you're you're also a famous or an award-winning uh, poet of English poetry yourself. And you've said that you learned how to write narrative poems by reading Persian narrative poetry. Can, can you describe what, first of all, what narrative poems are and how they might be more uniquely situated in Persian works? Um. Uh, uh, I, your, your question, I mean, they're wonderful questions, but each of them, I, I think, well, I've got six ways to answer that. Now, which one do I <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. Uh, uh, first of all, all, first right. of all let's, mean, let's, let's try and define a narrative poem. I'm assuming well, it's a, a, a poem, poem, poem that tells a, a story. Is that, is a that, poem that tells a story. Yes, oh, a don't all tells poems a tell a story or no? That's Not necessarily. Okay. I mean, you, you get a, a short lyric. A, a poem by Hafez doesn't tell a story. A poem by Hafez ex examines... A, a particular situation, but it doesn't tell a story. I mean, one of the things about Hafez, Hafez's poetry, for example, is that if you look in different editions of, of Hafez, and especially if you look in different manuscripts of Hafez, the the, you get the same lines in completely different orders um, the, in, within the poem. The lines are in different order. This means there isn't a progression through the poem. You're, it, it, it isn't a story that's being mm. told. It's the same situation which is being examined from different angles with each line but it's the same thing so that that's a that's a non-narrative poem Hafez is not narrative is that but what makes like, uh, Hafez so challenging you you've said you 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 always knew you couldn't do justice to Hafez even though you've translated his works is that why why is Hafez so challenging Hafez is challenging for a number of reasons one of them is that um, his poems are extremely ambiguous and there are, there are I, well, this is what I believe anyway. I think they're deliberately ambiguous. It's not that there is one straight answer. It's, a, it's, it's another, what I was saying about great poetry doesn't give you answers. It, it asks questions mm. or it, it poses problems. Um, a lot of people, when they read Hafez, they say it means this and it doesn't mean that. My feeling about Hafez is that it deliberately means both. <laughs> that that this, uh, many, many lines of, of Hafez and whole poems are ambiguous. They can be read in completely different ways. 
um, it, it, an obvious thing is a poem can be read as being about God or it can be read about be, as being about a human lover. That's, that's a very obvious example. And people will say, well, it's really about God or it's really about a human lover. But my feeling is that Hafez is deliberately writing it so that it can be about both, hmm. which is wonderful, but it makes it damn difficult to translate. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you even do that? Yeah, well, bringing the ambiguity yeah. out is, is very difficult. Yeah. It's why I, I did hesitate a long time before I, I mean, my publisher kept saying, come on, Dick, we do a Hafez. <laughs> and I, I hesitated for a long time because I, I even wrote a paper about how Hafez is impossible to translate. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, okay, so let me, I, I sorry, I took us down the, the Hafez path, okay. but, but we were talking about narrative poems and how you learn to write narrative poems by reading Persian narrative poetry. And I'm just, I thought that was an interesting thing that you once said that I wanted to pick up on. What, what was it about these Persian stories that you read that inspired you to be able to write them? Well, um, the kind of poetry I started writing when I was a young man was what we would call lyric poetry. It's love poems and poems about little moments. It doesn't tell a story at all. And they're short poems. You know, they, they, they don't go on for pages and pages. They're 10 lines or 14 lines or 20 lines, something like that. And they describe a moment or an emotion or some, something particular. And, and that, you know, when the poem ends, the, the, the story ends, as it were. There isn't, a, there isn't, you don't feel what happens next because that, that's it. It's all, it's all there. Now, uh, uh, Persian medieval poetry, the poetry I started reading, I started uh, reading sort of, the poetry I really got into when I was at, at university um, studying Persian what was the narrative poetry. It's poetry that tells a story that takes a long time to describe something and that um, goes into it in great depth. It, it doesn't say, I'm in love and this is what it's like to feel in love. It, it describes the situation from many aspects, and, and, uh, and it's highly decorated, too, in a way that most English poetry is not. Uh, as I said right at the beginning, Persian poetry is deliberately beautiful, or most of it is, in a way that most English poetry isn't. Um, that sense of being able to examine a subject over a long course of over many lines for example and to to tell a story uh, how how do you get the story out if you um, um if you have a story you have people in the story how do you represent what the people are like how do how do you establish that this person is like this this person is like this all the while writing in verse um that's not easy to do and i i i learned to do it reading persian narrative poetry i really did um, I mean, I had read English narrative poetry, but it's never really spoken to me. Yeah. Um, it's it's the short poems in English that I've always really loved. There are exceptions to that. The, um, I mean, th this is probably a, a tedious, uh, if not um, a stupid, question. But 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 how, how do you know if you are a narrative poet or you're a novelist? I mean, what what's the difference? Uh, um, how would you determine the difference if you're the person writing? <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, that's, that's, it's very hard. Um, uh, I think I've noticed this about writers, that they always think that the thing they don't do is the really hard thing to do. And I know that most, novel, <laughs> most novelists say that it's, really, it's much harder to write, to write poetry than to write novels. I think it's much harder to write novels than to write poetry, mm. because I've, I've always written poetry. I have tried to write a couple of novels. They were dreadful, really awful, terrible. And I remember reading a novel, I mean, this is off the subject of Persian, but as you've asked, I remember reading a novel by Graham Greene. I think it was um, The Quiet American. Mm. Uh, and uh, his, the opening chapter, I think, is, is four pages. Um, it's very short. And he, in, in, the, in that four pages, he establishes two characters, what they're like, their relationship, um, the whole social situation that they live in. Um, and it, it, it happens in, in Vietnam. Um, and it, one of the characters is, is uh, an American and one of them is, is, is a Vietnamese. And so th there's also this feeling of, of cultural difference and, and also a, there's a power difference between them and all that. He establishes all this in four pages. And I read it and I read it sort of with, and I thought I could never do that. So I thought, right, OK, uh, novels are not for me. I'm going <laughs> to stick with poetry. <laughs> Um, so that, that I mean, that was my my way of seeing that I wasn't a novelist. There is another thing which which actually tells against a poet, but um, the probably the greatest poet in English, the greatest British poet in English of the 20th century is W. H. Auden. Mm. And uh, somebody asked Auden 
uh, if he'd ever thought of writing a novel. Uh, Auden was, was very witty. He was always putting himself down. He said, oh, no, no, no. I, I, if you write novels, you have to be interested in other people. <laughs> now, there's, there's a real truth in that. Right, right, and, right. Um, poets, I, I mean, I, I try, obviously I try and be interested in other people, but poets find, find it very difficult to get out of their own head. Mm. Uh, and I've, I've noticed that about the poets I know. It's very difficult for them to sort of disengage themselves from their own sensibility. To be a good novelist, you have to be able to do that. Part of the and reason I, I, I ask the, this is because I find the the terminology confusing. I, I always have, especially when it comes to Persian works. Um, you know, when I was younger, I would hear the Shahnameh described as a poem. And I remember mm. the first time I saw uh, the Shahnameh in book form, I was like, this is a poem? It's a fucking, you know, it looks like Ulysses, right? <laughs> How is this a poem? So uh, I mean, my idea of a poem was like something that you see on one page and, and there's a rhyme pattern or something, you know? So um, I, I, I'm on a lifelong quest to try and figure out what these things are. But. Well, well, yeah, well, I mean, with medieval poetry, it's easy. A poem is something which has rhyme and meter. Um, but with modern poetry, it's more complicated. Um, uh, and of course, my heart has always been in the medieval period. My own, I mean, you mentioned my own poetry. My, my own poetry, uh, by the standards of most people who, 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 who write poetry now, is extremely old-fashioned. I mean, it, it, it has rhyme, it has meter, it's, uh, it's not in free verse. Um, and it was old-fashioned when I started. You know, it's not as if, it's not yeah. as if I've outgrown the fashion. Um, I, I, I sort of started middle-aged, as it were. Well, well, um, well, well speaking of old-fashioned, I mean, the choice of translating a modern work like My Uncle Napoleon really stands out in your in your canon. It, it's certainly not a work of medieval Persian poetry, but um, it was wildly popular and um, very influential and, and important, I would say, in, in, in the modern works of uh, Iranian uh, writers. What attracted you to taking on that gig? Well, it was a number of things. One was um, uh, my wife and I, Afkam and I, we, we came to England. We came to England when the revolution was really sort of getting going. And there was a lot of optimism in Iran and a lot of optimism outside Iran. Um, but then the revolution started to go sour. They started executing people from the previous government. <clears throat> I remember the execution of Haveda, who was the Shah's, not the Shah's mm. last prime minister, but the, 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 he was the major. There was there were, there were a couple after Haveda, but he, he was the big prime minister for most of the time mm. I was there. And Haveda was, I mean, he may have had his faults, but he certainly wasn't an evil person. And he certainly didn't deserve to be shot like that. That was when I changed about the revolution, the execution of Haveda. Um, but also, it very, and then there was the American hostage crisis, yes. and Iran became a place which was totally vilified in the West. Yes. I mean, it's, it hasn't changed that much now, although it's better now than it was then. It was seen as a place of, of sort of dour theological barbarism. Yes. Um, and that was not the Iran I knew at all. You know, I mean, my Iran had been utterly different from that. My Iran had been a welcoming, humane, kind, generous place where I had been very well treated and I'd had a wonderful time. And I felt, and Uncle Napoleon, it, 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 I mean, the, the characters in Uncle Napoleon, they're very, very Iranian, but they're very, very human too. And they're not at all like the caricature of, of Iran that was going around um, after the revolution. And so one of the reasons I wanted to, trans, I, I thought I'd try and translate Uncle Napoleon was just that, that it shows such a, a humane and funny and charming and welcoming version of, of Iranian society. And, and the, the people in, in it, they're recognizable people that you can find in any society. I mean, the, the, the person like Asadol and Mirza, for example, and, and uh, all, all of them, you know, mm. the whole lot, mm. uh, Aziz al-Saltani. Uh, there are lots of English Aziz al -Saltanis. So it was the humanity of it that I, and also the humor. Um, humor was not something that was associated with Iran in the West at, at that time at all. And also the earthiness. Uh, it was seen as a place that that that, that was had been taken over by a kind of crazy spirituality, which which discounted all the kind of earthy side of life. Well, um, uh, my my uncle Napoleon Daijan is is very earthy. So one reason was I wanted to show that Iran was not like, or it wasn't only like what all the propaganda and right was saying to un undermine like. some stereotypes. Yes, sure, undermine some stereotypes. What were the other exactly. reasons? The other reason was that I had never translated a, a novel, and I wanted to see if I could do it. It was a, it was a test for myself. Also, I saw 
that uh, uh, you can say there are two kinds of humor there's uh, in novels there's situational humor which is humor um, which is based on characters and incidents and things like that and then there's linguistic humor which is humor which is based on language and a lot of the humor in uncle Nap- there's there's a lot of situational humor and the whole basis of it is situational yes. but there's a lot of linguistic humor there's a lot of humor which is based on the way characters speak the different kind of social levels that they speak at um the the, the way that uh Astolomeza, for example talks about sex all that kind of thing there, uh, there's a lot of of, of uh, and then then there's there's the servant Mashkosem, who speaks this kind of um rural working class um, person and i thought am i going to be able to convey all those differences of and i just wanted to see if i could do it i, I was really a test for myself uh and, and as i got into it I, I loved it more and more, and mm. I, I thought, well, I might not be doing this very well, but I'm having a great time. Um, so I, so I, I, fin- I did it. I finished it. It is. Um, it's such a great pleasure to get to talk to you. I want to end off with a few questions, a couple questions about um, about being a translator, and and maybe I can start with segue out of uh, uh, my uncle Napoleon because that's a case where at least when you. Uh, sadly, he's passed now. But when you wrote, uh, when you did the translation, uh, Iraj Pezikzad was still alive, and yes. um, in that, ca- I mean, I, obviously you can't consult with Ferdowsi when you translate the Shahnameh. But, but in that case, do do you speak to the author? Do you um, check in with him, or do you show uh, translations, or 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 is it just sort of um, does the publisher or the author kind of give their blessing and then you're off to the races by yourself? Um, I've got a funny story about that. When I, st- when I started to trans, I did I did a couple of chapters, and then um, major publishers said they would publish it if I did the whole thing. So I thought, well, I'd better get Pezzisard's permission. So I wrote to him, and I got this postcard back, um, in which basically he, 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 the postcard was in Persian. He gave me two conditions. One was I had to finish it in two years, and if I hadn't finished it in two years, he, he withdrew the permission and that was I, I found out later it was because that somebody had offered to translate it into French and done half of it and then given up uh, and um, he had turned other people away who wanted to translate it and then nobody wanted to do it and so he was angry about that which was un- very understandable mm-hmm. and the other one was that I would send him my versions um, every chapter chapter by chapter I would send it to him to review and he would send back a card saying, yes, it's fine, keep going, yes, it's lovely, keep going. And, and I got all these cards back. And then after a while, I thought, well, I'll send him three or four chapters. I, because he hadn't so far made any negative criticisms. And then much later, I found out that his, his um, Pezistad's European language was French. He spoke French perfectly, oh. but he really didn't know English very well. Right. Yeah, he was and in he Paris, couldn't. yeah. Yes, he was in Paris, and he couldn't really understand my translation. I mean, I, um, um, I, so his, his saying that, you know, I, I want to see it, it was a way of saying to me, you make sure you do it properly, because right, I'm going to check right, it. Right, right. But, but, but he couldn't actually check it. Right, it was a kind right. of joke. It was, it was a joke very much in the spirit of, the, of his book, in fact. You know, he, was, he was keeping me to something by, by conning me a little bit. By, well, well by, that, by, I mean, by, that raises the... That, that's, a, as I say, a good segue, because... Um, I, I've really wanted to ask you, I'm always fascinated with, when it comes to, to translators, especially translators. I mean, this is a particularly amped up uh, case with you because um, you're translating major works, historic, mm. classic works, and mm. you're the preeminent, I mean, you know, as the Washington Post says, or whatever, the preeminent translator of these, these Persian works, um, which is fabulous. Uh, and at the same time, I would suspect it means that there's a lot of responsibility for you. In other words, when I'm reading um, the Shah Nam era, my, my Uncle Napoleon, translated by Dr. Dick Davis, I'm reading your interpretation of these works. Sure. Yeah. And, and I've got to imagine... It's a little bit like when I asked you a question earlier and you said, I'm thinking of six different ways I can answer that. It, it's probably mm-hmm. something like that when you first read the poem, right? You sort of think, well, what are the six different ways I can, I can do this? And so how do you know if you're getting it right? Well, you don't. It's the short answer. You do your best. I mean, I, when, I, when I was applying to do my PhD at Manchester, I went up there uh, and I talked to the person who would be my Sort of di- my supervisor, my director of studies, and uh, he said, "Why do you want to do this?" And I, I said, um, 
perhaps your listeners won't recognize the reference, so I'll explain it. I said, I would like to be the Arthur Whaley of Persian literature. Now, Arthur Whaley was a person who lived in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and he translated the major works of Japanese and Chinese literature into mm. English, which were not known in the West at all. And I mean, a lot of people criticize his translations now. They say, you know, they're not that good, where better ones have been done and so forth. But the thing was, he made the West aware of that literature in a way that it hadn't mm. been before. And I was very conscious that, that English-speaking society was just not aware of this wonderful stuff that there was in Iran. And I at least wanted to make them aware in the way that Martha Whaley had done. Of course, I wanted to do the translations as well as I could. But even if they were bad translations, if they were out there, there, people would say, ah, oh, there is a great epic poem in Persian, or there is a great love story, or there is a great Sufi mm. allegory, you know, um, ju just, just to put these things on the map in the West, in the way that um, uh, Arthur Whaley had done for Japanese and Chinese culture, especially Japanese, but also Chinese. Um, and Arthur Whaley was a much greater scholar than I am, and I'm not comparing myself at all, but I wanted to do a similar kind of thing, and that's what I've tried to do. In terms of in terms of responsibility, well, as I say, you do your best. If I, if I can tell, a, there's a story in the Shahnameh which I've, I've often used to illustrate what, a, what I think a translator should be. Okay. Um, the story is it's, it's, from, it's quite late in the Shahnameh. It's in the Sasanian part of the poem, after Alexander the Great, just before the Arabs come. Um, it's, the, it's the reign of Khosrow Parviz, and there's a, there's a, a, a musician called Barbad, and Barbad hopes that he can be a court musician, but all the all the, um, the musicians who are already there at the court, they're jealous of him, so they keep him away from the court, so the king never hears him play. And he's very despondent. And then he meets a gardener, the, one of the king's gardeners, and the gardener says, look, I'll hide you in a tree. And when the king comes, I know that the king's going to sit in a particular place uh, in the evening and drink his wine there, uh, and, and so there'll be an entertainment. And you be in the tree and you play. Um, and you'll be hidden in the tree, and that's what he does. And he he plays these these, uh, these he plays and sings, and the king of course can't see him, and he says, "What is that? What is that marvelous thing?" And you know, he, now when I when I when I, I wrote about this, I said, "What, what the translator ideally is like Barbad, he should hide himself in the tree." Mm. You know, Barbad has this. He knows these songs, which are ancient songs, and now he sings them, and he makes them, he makes them present for the king. He brings them into the present, and he brings them to this particular audience. That's what a translator should do. But Barbad has hidden himself. He doesn't push himself forward. The king can't see him. On the other hand, in order to sing the songs at all, Barbad has to use his voice. So although you hide yourself as a translator, you have to use your own voice. Um, and that's the tricky thing. By using your own voice, you're revealing yourself. But I really have tried to keep myself out of my translations as much as I can. But it's impossible. You're there in the translation. And you can see this. I mean, um, for example, Homer in, 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 uh, in Western epic. Homer's been translated into English virtually every generation. So there's, there's tens, if not hundreds, of versions of Homer. And everyone is different. They're all different from each other because they're written at different times by different people with different sensibilities, with different interests, different vocabularies, and so forth. And each, your own voice is there, no matter how much you want to get rid of it. The other thing I've tried to do is I only translate works that I really admire and really love. And I want to do justice to mm. the author. I, don't, I, I, I literally I have done, I do this when I translate. I imagine the author watching me, and the author, and I think, I, I, can I say this? No, he won't like that. I can't say that. I've got. Well, I, I have a sort of analogy that uh, I, let me try it on you, and and to, to you you see if this works for you in terms of helping me understand how you see your role, uh, and that is I I wonder how important translating meaning um. Transferring, uh, uh, demonstrating tone is to this. Obviously, the, we under, we can understand the dynamics of translating words, but um, the 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 effort to translate tone. So for me, the analogy would be: um, there's a Bob Dylan song that Bob Dylan has mm -hmm. written, and he's singing. And mm. you're going to cover the song, yeah. um, uh, in in Persian or you know whatever. Uh, maybe let's say if, even you're just going to cover the song in English. Are you mm. trying to sound like Bob Dylan, who has a particular twang and way that he sings, or are you trying to commute? Are you trying to um, leave the listener with the impression of how they would feel if they're listening to this Bob Dylan song? 
Um, well, in translating, um, to answer your question in a roundabout way, really I'm trying to do the latter. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I translate something, and it, it, of course, it's, it's all a, it's a question of, of, of part scholarship, part imagination, mostly imagination with some as much scholarship as one has. Um, but I, I asked myself, the, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around, but the first thing about translating is you're not translating words, you're translating meanings. And this mm. is very important because if you translate word for word, it's going to sound rubbishy. You can't do that. You have to say to yourself, what does the line mean? And it's the meaning you put into English, not the words. A, a very obvious thing is, is um, uh, uh, translating Dijon, for, for, for example, the insults, like pedasuchte. If you translate that literally <laughs> into English, it's ridiculous. It doesn't Your mean anything. Father is burned, yeah, or exactly. something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You, 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 you've got to translate the meaning, not, right, not, not, not right, the words. Right. And that's true altogether. And what I ask myself is, I, I want to put the meaning into English so that the reader is going to feel something as close as I can get it, and it's mm, obviously not mm. that close, as close as I can get it to what I think an original reader of Ferdowsi or Nezami mm. or Attar would feel when he read the poem. Mm. What would an Iranian feel when he first heard Ferdowsi? Um, now, my language is not Ferdowsi's language. It's not nearly as noble. It's not nearly as strong. But I want to get as, as close as I can to it mm. so that the English reader get something of what it's like to be a Persian reading, the, right, the, right. an Iranian reading the Persian. That's what I want to do. The feel, course, the feel of the Bob Dylan song. The feel of it, yes, you, yeah. you get the feel of it. Yes, that, that's it. Well, I he want didn't to love forget. my analogy. I don't. I noticed you, you skated away from the Bob Dylan, but but I, <laughs> but I, it works well, for me. I, because, I, I, they only skated away from it because you're, there you're talking about English and English. Yes, and it's yes, a different yeah. That thing when you're doing yeah, it to a... To you're a right. to, you're, yeah. Although some would argue that Bob Dylan doesn't really sing in English, so it's, well, there's that too. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of it sort of works. I I wonder about in this era of sensitivity around cultural appropriation. Like, I if I know the Iranian community uh, around the world, um, I I can only imagine that uh, everyone is quite grateful to have this guy who this eminent scholar who grew up in in. Britain came to Iran, loved the culture, and is now in America. Does these translations? It, it almost feels like an, you're honoring the culture. But has it ever? Have, have you ever had the opposite reaction? Has anybody sort of gone, "Who are you to do this? This should be done by an Iranian." Have you ever faced that? Oh yes, I have. I mean, the the people being nice about the translations is far more common than the opposite. But I have received the opposite. I, I mean, it, particularly when I started out, I would get people who more or less said, "Who the hell do you think you are to be doing this?" Um, but you know, I, they, what, that wasn't common. But it did happen. I mean, it did happen occasionally. Um, also, you know, I would say that I was working on a particular poem. And this person, who I could see didn't really know the poem, he, he knew the poem by reputation, he would explain to me what the poem was about. <laughs> and I thought, look, I really know this poem backwards. I, I'm not interested in, you know, that kind of thing. But mostly people have been very generous. Um, most Iranians have been more generous than I deserve, I feel. I, I'm very grateful to the way the Iranian community has has accepted my translations. Um, you, I mean, it, you're 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 really one of the greats. And let me let me just finish off with a general question, if you'll indulge me with this one, which is, um, um, I mean, let me go super general. Why why do you think? My my feeling is that there continues to be an interest in Persian poetry and and literature. Um, I would say even even an increase in the sort of canonizing of say Rumi, for example, in mm. in Western pop culture, um, yeah. in in recent years. W what do you attribute that to? Uh, that's that's well, Rumi is a particular case. You know, almost all now there are major exceptions to what I'm going to say, but almost all the Rumi which is available uh, in English is not Rumi. It's not even remotely roomy. It's uh, no. It's, what do you mean? Um, it's most of the most most of the people who who quotation marks have translated roomy. They don't know Persian, um, and um, what they're doing is they're taking an idea and a poem and they're writing their own poem, and that's fine. But don't pretend it's roomy because it. Because, now there are major exceptions to that. I mean, the the translation is a, there's a translation of the, of the Masnavi which is going on at the moment by a guy called Javid uh, Mojadeddi. 
uh, and that's a wonderful translation, mm. uh, and it, it's beautifully done, and it really is Rumi. And there are there are other other very good translations too. But a lot of what people think of as Rumi is in fact um, it's it's the translator's own poems. It, it's it's very very. I mean, it's so far from the, from the original poems that you can't tell what poem's being translated. You, you can't tell which poem of Rumi it's supposed to be because uh, the, the, the English is so far away. So Rumi is a special case. Um, and some translations of Hafez are like that too. Mm. I mean, I, I could, could give you a couple of names, but I won't. Um, it's, it's not fair. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, we, we, do, we do live in a world in which cultures, just because of communications and, and, and radio and instant communication from one side of the, and telephones and everything from one side of the globe to the other, everybody is very conscious of other cultures. And most people who are not sort of parochially stupid and think that, oh, my culture is the only interesting culture. And of course, there are people like that in every damn culture. Mm. That they think that my culture is the best and I'm not interested in anything else. But most people who aren't like that, and I hope that is most people, in fact, they're, they're interested in other cultures. Um, they, they want to know what other cultures are like. One can only, I mean, there are so many cultures, there's so much literature, one can only do so much. But I felt that, I felt that there's enough in Persian poetry, which I loved, um, that there was enough there that I could show other people that it was worth loving too. That's that's what I wanted to do. But that it that that. But I I I I I want people I want people when they read my Ferdowsi to feel obviously they're reading my Ferdowsi they're reading English, mm. but I don't want them to feel they're just reading Dick Davis. I want them to feel that they're getting something of what Ferdowsi is, not just me, but the actual the actual Ferdowsi or Attar or or whoever it is. Do you agree that there? It feels like there's a, a growing interest in in Persian works, or am I? Is that wishful thinking on my part? There is, but it's gradual. And um, I, I mean, I've talked about this many times, especially with my publisher, um, that Persian literature is still majorly underrated. It's still not seen as the truly great literature as it is. Um, you know, there are many great literatures in the world, and I, and I hate this kind of, you know, this literature is better than that kind of thing. Every literature is wonderful according to its own mm. standards, and the standards are different in different literatures. So if by English standards, English literature is the best, but by Persian standards, Persian literature is the best, and so on for Italian and all the others too. Um, but by any, by any criterion, by, by any way of measuring, Persian has a major literature, a great literature. One thing you can say is that in different cultures at different times, most of the sort of artistic energy seems to go into one art form. Like you get an awful lot of wonderful painters in the Renaissance in Italy, and then you get an awful lot of wonderful composers in Germany in the late right, 18th and right. 19th centuries. But now in Iran, that, that in the Middle Ages, that energy, that, that wonderful artistic energy, it went into lots of different forms too, but it mainly went into poetry. That's right. where the real genius of Iran went. And it went on for a long time. If you think of the, the major period of British literature, it's from about 1560 to 1700. It's 150 years something like that. The major period of Iranian literature, it lasts from the, from the, the 11th century to the 15th century. It's a long period, with, and there's a lot of great poetry in there, not just a few great poems, many, many great poems, and most of them still are, are, don't have the recognition in the West that they deserve. Dr. Dick Davis, what a great pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for the education. Um, thanks for the uh, enthusiasm. And um, uh, I, I can only be grateful for this uh, hour and, and plus that we spent together. Thank you for this. Well, thank you very much for asking me. I've, en I've enjoyed talking about it. I'm always tr ready to talk about Persian poetry and mm. get people to try and read it. <laughs> I hope we'll so. do it again soon. Um, talk you. to you soon. Thank you again, and uh, hello to, you, uh, to 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 your your wife uh, um, and the the Persian community in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. I've enjoyed doing it. Thanks for asking me. Good Cheers. Office. Bye bye. This is Rook, episode 276, the best of Rook, 
And remember, for all things Rook related, our back episodes, our videos, our complete programming, go to our website, rookmedia.com. It's the hub of all things we do. It's also where you can link to all of our platforms and social media. Rookmedia.com is the place. Check it out if you haven't already. You know, there are various occasions on this program where stories are told and laughter ensues, and sometimes it has to do with learning and utilizing Persian words in the middle of telling tales. This is one of those moments from a couple of years ago with Reza and Keon and Shia where I told the story of my dog getting into an encounter with another animal. Here on The Best of Rook, this is Ugi and the Rasu. Ask me how a week, my week was. How was your week, Jeanne? Uh, well, since I last saw you, had some weird moments. What kind of weird moments? Oh, funny you should ask. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, after the show last week, so you know my, my little son, my adorable uh, French bulldog, Oogie. I was just going to ask, you have a son? No, <laughs> yeah. Kind well, of love child? No, no, my dog. My oh, right, dog. Yes, my dog, dog yes, Oogie. Yes. Uh, and you know, Oogie comes with me everywhere. He yeah. comes to our studio. I mean, he's not in here right now because mm. uh, he would be, he might get uh, Mozahem inside <laughs> the studio, but he but he comes to uh, the, the Rook offices. Everywhere I go, he's basically. He's so well behaved. Oogie has to uh, come with me. Uh, you know, it's single parent. Um, he comes with me everywhere. So <laughs> last week, last Thursday, do you know the story, Reza? No, I don't. Okay. So last Thursday, I mean, it's not that big a deal, but uh, last Thursday we had a big show. We had the, mm. we had the uh, Shachnush to Parsipur, we had Hadi Kaimi, we had Cyrus Norste, it was a three hour show, uh, and we had the letters, all that stuff. So, so we were here, as you guys remember, till, uh, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock, and we've been here since early in the morning, this is last Thursday. And so uh, I, I'm exhausted, I'm going home, uh, Ugi and I are going home, uh, exhausted, and I, I may have, I can neither con- uh, confirm or deny, but I, I may have stopped at a fast food place on the way home. Which one? And, and gotten some pickup. Uh, uh, some, uh, which, which one? It, it may rhyme with, uh, <laughs> I may have stopped at a Scottish restaurant on the way home. <laughs> ah, does restaurant. it rhyme with whack Donald's? It, it does rhyme with w- yes. It, that's that's. I, like I may have stopped the, the lowest the, point at, at in Mickey your life. D's. It, I know it doesn't. I know. Listen, I mean, you know, you can. So I so I buy my yeah. That's right. I've got some McDonald's. Uh, you got your quarter pounder. I got my uh, uh, and so and this it's like midnight. Mm. I'm exhausted. All I can think is I'm gonna sit on my couch, you know, shamelessly eat this <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, I have probably have some, you know. Uh, or something in the fridge that my mom has made me or like I, I made earlier in the week but I'm eating McDonald's you know yeah. I'm, uh, it's just uh, that long it's been that long a day and yeah. it's been and I just want to kind of catch up with the news of the day uh, and and eat and then go to bed and get up early and come back here right so so as we get out, I get to my house and we get out and uh, Ugi there's a lane next to my house where Ugi at night uh, I take him for his so, so he can do his business, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, usually, I mean, if it's at like around midnight, I, you know, I don't really t- need to put him on a leash, as you say. He's a well-behaved he dog. Is. He's a couple years old, but he's already really, uh, you know, he's he's understands what, you know, he's got a sense of decorum about him, <laughs> little Ugi. So we go out in the lane, and before anything can happen, Ugi charges away from me, he starts oh, running, you know, God. he's seen something. And as just as I see where he's going towards the end of the lane, in, in kind of a, like you'd see in a TV show or in a movie, and in slow motion, I'm screaming, no, no. <laughs> and, and just then at the end of the lane, I see a giant skunk that Ugi is running towards. What is the, what's, uh, how do we say, Sage uh, Siosefid? No. How do we say uh, skunk in? Rasu, I think. Rasu. Rasu Bumide. Yeah, Bumide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rasu. 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 So I see a Rasu. <laughs> <laughs> a huge, uh, oh, you know, the, the it looked like a really big skunk. And I see Ugi. Oh, no. You're charging. To, by the way, Ugi, this little 30 pound French bulldog, he. He, he goes, runs after everything. I, he has no idea what he would ever do if he catches them, right? <laughs> like, he, I, I don't know what he would do because he's not really that tough. Like, he thinks he's uh, tough. So, but he's running after this skunk. And <clears throat> just as I'm saying no, just as I, I see it and it's happening, it all happens like split second, uh, he gets to the skunk and the skunk zaps him, you know, sprays oh. him. And Oogie recoils backward. Oh! 
Oh, like he oh, falls oh, back no. and he's sort of trying to grab his eyes <laughs> and he's rolling on the ground and the skunk runs away. Runs away and so then Oogie uh, and I'm like, no, no. And, I, <laughs> and Oogie starts running back towards me. Then I start running away from Oogie, <laughs> oh, right? God. I don't want Oogie to catch me now. So yeah. then I run into the house and Oogie, <laughs> I close the door really quickly and Oogie comes up and Oogie's like looking at me oh. through the window, like let oh. me in. And oh. his oh. mouth is frothing and his oh, eyes are God. bulging out and he's been, you know, and I can smell through the door oh, that the, no. the sky, oh. you know, the, the, the rasu, yep. rasu the, yeah. the smell of the rasu, uh, <laughs> Sorry, well, you love that word. Now, I, right? I would not expect it to be rasu. <laughs> yeah. That's why I think saga si yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of Rosu. what a, what it's going to be, right? So very French. Uh, saga boo or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, the rasu. So what did you I, do? I saw the rasu. It was uh, beautiful <laughs> at the <laughs> cafe. Uh, I have a muffin and some rasu. <laughs> yeah, so the rasu. Uh, so I, when a rasu first sprays the, 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 the French bulldog, it, it actually has a burning kind of smell i don't know if you've ever smelled skunk i try not to right when it happens not in the aftermath yeah. anyway this has happened once before with oogie <laughs> so i i so i kind of knew what where what 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 the next two hours were going to be for me but oh but i was so angry also my mcdonald's bag <laughs> is sitting outside the door on the porch next to oogie so like that's a write-off oh, you know because now he's yeah. covered you the see McDonald's. That? that's how the universe works you buy mcdonald's <laughs> that's right <laughs> this is what happens so so uh i was so upset you know i was i went through this kind of complete I, I went through the complete history of oogie like you know getting him as a baby like, like i'm like why do i have this dog you know it's it's midnight i've worked for 12 hours i i, I just want to eat my mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> and go to bed now the rasu has <laughs> attacked oogie <laughs> So you left him out there so, for two so hours? So no, no, I didn't leave. Well, that would see, that's not even an option because Oogie can't fend for himself. I can't, you know, part of me was just like, I'm just going to leave him out all night. But, you know, he'd be like, how do I? I mean, this is a Think dog that, what you've done. this is ostensibly a tough dog that eats a, a vet prescribed gastrointestinal <laughs> intestinal organic food. Like he's a luxury dog, Aww. right? He doesn't know what to do out there, you know? So... So sure enough, like after I get over my upset, you know, uh, and my recounting the decisions I've made in my life, like, <laughs> like getting Oogie, I, I, I resign myself to the next two. So I take off all my clothes because you have to be completely oh naked, God. you know, I, I play, I, I, fortunately I had this huge like this huge bottle of tomato paste in, in the uh, fridge, which was a really lousy tomato paste that I'd used like a little bit of for a pasta, you know, a month ago or something. And I, I'd actually been eyeing it for the last few weeks thinking, I got to throw that out. Why am I keeping oh. that? Well, now I know why I was Perfect. keeping it. So I mixed up that with a bunch of water. I also got some vinegar, you know, oh. I sprang into action with it. <laughs> but but the indignity of, you know, taking, getting naked, <laughs> scooping up Oogie, <laughs> running, you know, so that the, the boo of the rasu doesn't get it throughout the house and then running to the the shower and then for the next half an hour covering oogie and of course myself in tomato juice uh, and then vinegar you know and, and and oogie of course hates it he's like looking at me like that why what happened to me with the rasu and now i've got tomato juice and then you know dogs like every every moment that i can't hold him tight he does the shake like the yeah. dog shake yeah. so then tomato juice is everywhere oh. like it looks like oh. blood all over over the yeah, you know Lord, shower and what a, mess. what a yeah. poetic end to your Thursday. It's That's right, almost and beautiful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then I, I used his shampoo. I but they, actually it worked. I mean, I got you know tomato paste. Is that the tomato what you tomato need to juice? Use? Yeah, tomato hmm. juice. But you gotta you rub it in, and then I used the vinegar. I mean, it sounds horrible, but it does. but so is the skunk smell, right? The, let me tell you, a rasu. <laughs> 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 so anyway, huh. I mean that's it's not smart. how it sounds. That's yeah. for sure. The saga cf sefid. Um, so I, yeah, that was my that was my that was the big that was the last time you saw me, Keon. Yeah. that's what happened that wow, night. Wow, that is yeah. epic. One can only wonder what will happen tonight. <laughs> There you go, from a couple of years ago, it still uh, frightens me thinking of that night. The story of Oogie and the Rasu on The Best of Rook. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook-related, 
go to our website, rookmedia.com, where you can actually find all of our funnies, including that story, if you want to hear it again. Thanks to the amazing team who work at Rook Media, Smart Pega, Savvy Rohan, Bearded Omid, Super Parisa, Talented Anahita, and Sound Person Louise. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Some of you listen and you don't actually subscribe. Subscribe on any or all of our platforms. Find us in social media. You can find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. And as ever, remember, Mizunbashi. Mizunbashi.